and welcome back to my videos for General Chemistry 2. Today I want to tell you about the connection between two things that don't seem like they're related, but they actually are. One is the creation of streetlights in England back in the early 19th century, and the other is a terrible tragedy that occurred around a remote lake in the jungles of Western Africa. To get there, let's start by looking at something very basic that you might have noticed in the last few videos. When we were talking about the phase diagrams and heating and cooling curves, we were always looking at single compounds, like water or CO2. But what happens when we combine two substances? That's a much more common situation. All the fluids in your body are made of many different compounds. Usually they're primarily made of water, with lots of other compounds dissolved in it. This is also true for most of the reactions we do in general chemistry. The reactants are dissolved in water. As you might recall from the General Chemistry 1 course, when the solvent is water, we say that such a solution is aqueous. So, what happens when a compound dissolves in water? It depends on what kind of a solid it is. In ionic solids, the ionic bonds are broken, so the compound breaks apart into its cations and anions. For example, if we have sodium chloride, it breaks apart into sodium plus ions and chloride minus ions. If we dissolve cobalt 2 nitrate, we get a cobalt 2 ion and two nitrate ions. On the other hand, if we dissolve a molecular solid, it's not ionic bonds that are broken. Instead, the intermolecular forces that hold the molecules to each other are broken, so the molecules separate. That means we have individual molecules floating in our solution. For example, this is what happens with table sugar, or sucrose, which is a molecular compound. So, how does the solvent break these ionic bonds and intermolecular forces? The secret is to remember the structure of water molecules. As we discussed in several earlier videos, water is a very polar molecule, which means one side has a slight positive charge, and the other side has a slight negative charge. That means the positive side will be attracted to the negative ions in an ionic solid, and the negative side of the water molecules will be attracted to the positive ions. The water molecules pull these ions away from the solid, and that makes the solid slowly dissolve. But what makes one compound soluble in another? Well, way back in video 11 of General Chemistry 1, we talked about the solubility rules that predict whether or not a solid will dissolve in water. Here's a list of those rules, but you should go back and watch that video to get a full explanation. We'll be talking about these solubility rules again in a future video in this course. But that's for situations where we're trying to dissolve a solid in a liquid. What if we're trying to dissolve one liquid in another, or a gas in a liquid? That's what we'll talk about for the rest of this video. For example, what if we want to mix two liquids together? How can we tell whether or not they'll be soluble in each other? The key is to figure out whether or not the two compounds are polar. In general, two liquids will form a solution if they're either both polar or both nonpolar. But if one is polar and the other isn't, then the liquids won't be soluble in each other. So, for example, water and methanol are both polar compounds. If we combine them, they mix together and form a solution. The same is true if we combine cyclohexane and carbon tetrachloride, which are both nonpolar compounds. But if we try to combine water, which is polar, and carbon tetrachloride, which isn't, we find out that the mixture separates into two layers. We can't form a uniform solution. When two liquids form a solution, we say that they are miscible in each other. So water and methanol are miscible, and so are cyclohexane and carbon tetrachloride. If we try to combine a polar and a nonpolar liquid, we find that they are immiscible. This property is summed up by a phrase you might have heard before, which is, like dissolves like. Now, suppose we wanted to make a solution of salt water. We could take a spoonful of sodium chloride and dissolve it in a beaker of water. We could make it more concentrated by adding another spoonful of salt. And we could keep doing that with more and more salt. 
But remember, salt dissolves because the ions get surrounded by water molecules. But we only have a finite number of water molecules. Eventually, we'll add so much sodium chloride that no more will dissolve because all the water molecules are already busy with dissolved ions. So there's a limit to how much of any solid we can dissolve, even for very soluble compounds like NaCl. When our solution is as concentrated as it can get, and no more will dissolve, we call it a saturated solution. So, what determines how much of a compound we can dissolve before it becomes saturated? Well, it depends on a couple of things. One is the temperature. Usually, more solute can dissolve when we raise the temperature. You're already familiar with this one. If you try to dissolve sugar in cold iced tea, you'll find that it's much harder to do than if you try it when the tea is hot or at room temperature. Another way we can change how soluble something is, is by changing the pressure. This is true for solids, but it's especially easy to see when we try to dissolve a gas in our solvent. For instance, when we have a bottle of soda, you know that it has carbon dioxide dissolved in it. Here's an unopened bottle. It looks like plain water. There's no evidence of any gas in it. That's because right now, there's a fairly high pressure, much more than one atmosphere, in the bottle above the liquid. When I unscrew the cap, I release all that pressure. Now the pressure above the liquid is lower. It's just the same as the pressure in the room. As a result, the carbon dioxide in the soda isn't as soluble in the water, and it doesn't stay dissolved anymore. Another place where this effect is important is when you're scuba diving. Deep underwater, the pressure you experience is very high. So just like the gas in the water bottle, the amount of gas that can dissolve in your blood under that pressure is higher than usual. If you then come to the surface of the water, the pressure outside your body is much lower, and that means the extra gas in your blood won't be as soluble anymore, and it'll escape to form bubbles. That can be very dangerous, and it can cause pain, dizziness, and loss of vision. To prevent that from happening, it's important to come to the surface slowly so that the excess gas has a chance to escape without forming bubbles. The person who figured out the connection between the solubility of a gas and the pressure of the liquid was William Henry, and the relationship he discovered is named Henry's Law after him. Here it is. This tells us that the solubility of a gas is equal to a constant times the pressure. The solubility is just the concentration of the gas that we can dissolve in the liquid, which we usually measure in molarity, and the pressure is measured in atmospheres. The constant is called the Henry's Law constant, and it's different for every combination of solvent and the gas you're trying to dissolve in it. There's a table of these in our textbook. You'll be given them when you need them on a test or on the homework, so you won't need to memorize these. Let's try an example. Suppose we can dissolve 5.89 grams of acetylene, which is C2H2, in 250 milliliters of acetone at 0.870 atmospheres. What will be the Henry's Law constant? In this case, we're going to figure out KH instead of looking it up on a table. In order to do that, we'll need to know the solubility, S, and the pressure, P. P is easy. We were given that in the question, but we'll need to calculate S. Remember, S is measured in molarity, so we need to know the moles of gas and the liters of solution. We'll use the periodic table to find the moles of acetylene. When we do, we find out we have 0.226 moles. For the liters of solution, we'll use the volume of acetone, which is 0.250 liters. This is a little bit of an approximation, because the volume will increase a little when we dissolve the acetylene in it. But the difference will be very small, so it's still about 250 milliliters. This gives us a solubility of 0.905 molar, so we'll use that for S in the equation for Henry's Law. Now we can calculate the Henry's Law constant, which turns out to be 1.04 molar per atmosphere. Now that we know the Henry's Law constant, we can use it to predict the solubility of acetylene in acetone for any pressure. For example, suppose we raise the pressure of acetylene above the solution to 12.0 atmospheres. 
what will be the solubility of the acetylene now? Well, he used Henry's law again to solve this one. This time, we're trying to find the solubility, so that's our unknown. We figured out the Henry's law constant in the last problem and found out that it's 1.04 molars per atmosphere, and our pressure is 12.0 atmospheres. When we solve the equation, we find out that the new solubility is 12.48 molar. William Henry is also remembered for another reason nowadays. He was very interested in the behavior of gases, which is what led him to develop the law that's named after him. But he also used his expertise to discover new ways to use gases for heating and lighting. In fact, the very first streetlights in England were created using his inventions in Manchester, where he was a professor. You can still see one of his streetlights there today. The solubility of gases and liquids still has important consequences now, in addition to making carbonated sodas more fun to drink. Remember, I told you that the solubility of a gas depends on the temperature. That fact led to a terrible disaster in 1986 at Lake Nyos in the West African country of Cameroon. Lake Nyos is a very deep lake atop an extinct volcano. But even though the volcano is extinct, it still leaks carbon dioxide into the bottom of the lake. Because the lake is so deep, the top of the lake is noticeably warmer than the bottom. That means that the top of the lake contained more dissolved CO2 than the bottom did. Unfortunately, that had a serious consequence on August 21st of that year, when a landslide occurred. That disruption caused the CO2 in the lake to suddenly bubble out of the water, just like shaking a bottle of soda causes it to fizz. As a result, about 300,000 tons of CO2 were released from the lake in a huge cloud. Since CO2 is heavier than air, it crept along the ground and eventually covered an area with a radius of 16 miles. You can't breathe carbon dioxide, so many people and animals caught in the cloud of gas suffocated and died. Over 1,700 people and 3,600 livestock animals died because of the CO2. Since that happened, scientists have set up equipment to prevent too much carbon dioxide from building up in the lake. This photo shows the result. A system of tubes carries the gas away from the depths of the lake. Once the pressure builds, the gas gets released through the tube, taking some of the lake water with it to create a fountain. Well, that's enough new material for today. You've learned a lot in this video. We cover the solubility of solids, liquids, and gases, and we'll see soon that the concentration of a solute has an effect on lots of different natural phenomena. So, until I see you next time, have a good week!